All right, so today we're going to talk about respiratory assessment, um, illness, as well as diseases in the pediatric population. Again, like I always say, some of this is things that you have covered in your adult classes. Asthma, for example, um, I know you've covered in MedSurge 1. Um, pneumonia, things like that. Some of those are things that we might not harp on as much just because you have gotten that information before. We'll talk about some of the differences regarding the pediatric population but for the most part, you'll have to bring some of that information back into what you've already learned and apply it to the pediatric population. And we'll talk about how children are a little bit different um, than adults are. So when we're talking about children, um, respiratory illnesses are the number one cause of admission for children. Um, and there are a few factors that put children more susceptible to severe complications of respiratory illness more so than adults. Um, and you can see on the screen there's several listed, such as their immunity level, their age, um, if they have pre-existing conditions, if they're preterm. Um, but the number one factor that makes the biggest difference in the way pediatric patients respond to respiratory illness versus adults is anatomy, the size of their airway. Um, so when we're talking about upper structures, we talked a little bit with the ears how those short straight eustachian tubes and make them more prone to otitis media and things like that um, and when we're talking about the lower airways um, whether we're talking about the lungs or we're talking about the bronchi and, and the trachea um, this is why they are more susceptible to having symptoms of illness such as for example with RSV respiratory syncytial virus we'll talk about in a minute that's the one most people think of, especially with infants, is pretty scary because it, it can lead to hospitalization because it can lead to wheezing and respiratory distress. Um, many of you have probably had RSV and just didn't know it because you probably had just cold symptoms. Um, but the difference in an infant is because of where that swelling is located down in the lower um, airways then um, that little bit of swelling makes a huge difference. And you can see from the picture, the bottom airway shown is an adult airway. So if 50% of that airway, I'm sorry, if um, two millimeters of that airway is um, swelling, that's only 25% of the airway. But in an infant, that could be half their airway. So the, the size of the airway is the single biggest factor that makes the difference in why children are so much more susceptible to complications of respiratory illness over the adult. So how do we care for these patients as an overall for respiratory illnesses? So most respiratory illnesses, except for a few, a couple that we're going to talk about that are the exception, are going to be respiratory, or, I'm sorry, are going to be viral illnesses, which means for the most part, we don't give antibiotics for them. Um, most regulations of places nowadays is with respiratory illnesses. You should not treat with antibiotics until they're sick for 7 to 14 days because viral illnesses will go away within that time frame. And if they don't, it could be a secondary bacterial illness um, that you do want to treat. Um, but the biggest overview of how we treat these patients, for the most part, other than the couple I'm going to point out to you as we get to those, um, we don't give antibiotics. Um, it doesn't help to give antibiotics to a viral illness. Um, the other thing we don't give children, which is a bit of a different change from adults and sometimes can be an adjustment for people, is we do not give any kind of cough and cold medicines to children, especially under the age of six years old. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics through studies has found that that population has a much higher risk of side effects um, related to taking these medications and adverse effects with very minimal actual um, expected outcomes of these medications. So they really don't help the intended effects that they're designed to help in these younger populations um, and have a much higher risk of those side effects like tachycardia is definitely one of them. So um, under the if our pediatric patients in general, just keep in mind we do not give any kind of cough, cold medications, things like Mucinex, Robitussin, even the ones that are designed for children, when it comes down to it, the American Academy of Pediatrics does not recommend them. So what do we do for them? So one of the biggest things we should do is to ease their respiratory efforts. So anything we can do to calm them, um, encourage them to participate in calm activities, which can be easy when a child is first sick because they just want to lay around. But as they start feeling better, that can be much more difficult. And just because they're feeling a little bit better doesn't mean they're ready to run around. So making sure that 
They're not running around. They're not crying. Having the parent at the bedside can help with some of the anxiety that will um, increase the respiratory effort if they're anxious. Um, promoting, again, rest and comfort that goes into it. Y'all know all about preventing spread of infection. Um, using your um, PPE as allotted, uh, most respiratory infections are droplet, with the exception of your... Um, your RSV, your respiratory sensitive virus, that one is only contact. And then, of course, tuberculosis, which we don't focus on too much in the pediatric populations because it's pretty uncommon for a peds patient to get tuberculosis, but that one is your airborne. Um, giving them antipyretics for their temperature, um, hydration, and nutrition. So when children are sick, we don't really worry about nutrition too much. If they go a couple days without eating, it's not concerning but not drinking is very concerning. Um, we always wanna encourage fluid intake, even if they're not actually taking solid foods. Um, and one word I want you to get in your head when it comes to hydration is oral rehydration solution. So when you take NCLEX, when you take proctored tests, any test that you take, you won't see words like Gatorade and Pedialyte, which are the brand names of this. You will see the generic term, which is oral rehydration solution. So make sure when you look at hydration, you're thinking oral rehydration solution as far as oral um, hydration. And then, of course, support, reassurance, um, some of the comfort measures, maybe things like the bulb syringe or um, some of you got to experience in clinicals where they use, I call it, it looks like a little mushroom tip on it that they put up against the nose um, to suction out secretions. Those are very effective. Um, anything that helps them be more comfortable um, and help get out those secretions. Sometimes using hot or cold um, applications um, can also help as well. Um, another thing that we may use is um, your, your humidifiers. Those can also help thin out secretions as well as um, aid in, in just increased comfort of breathing. It lines the nasal passages with moisture and makes them feel less um, cracked. One thing when we're talking about hydration and nutrition, if they are eating, um, and it, especially if they're eating formula, we want to make sure that we are limiting their meals to where they are taking less amount more often. So if you have a baby who's taken eight ounces every four hours, for instance, an older baby, obviously, um, if they take um, eight ounces every four hours, that may be too much on their belly. Those of you that have been around babies, you know, when babies throw, when babies cough, they vomit, um, which is very common for them when they have respiratory illnesses. So instead of giving them eight ounces, you might give them four ounces every two hours. Same amount, um, just more frequent, smaller feedings that decreases their risk of vomiting. And of course, with their respiratory status already being hypersensitive, that also increases their risk of aspiration. Um, and if they're breathing but so hard or so fast, we will um, make them NPO because breathing but so fast, you can't breathe and drink at the same time. So if they have a an infant and it changes as they go up in ages, um, obviously, but in infants, if they have a respiratory rate greater than 60, we just make them NPO because if you're breathing that fast, you can't stop breathing that fast enough to drink and the aspiration risk is too great. So one of the things we do give antibiotics for is acute streptococcal pharyngitis, or many people will abbreviate it as strep infection. This is not the group beta strep we talked about back in for women in their vaginas. This is group A strep. This is what most people think of when they think of strep. Um, there are lots of manifestations associated with strep. Pretty much any illness that would come into kid bed, we would do a strep test on. Um, so probably some of the more obvious ones that people think about is sore throat and fever. Um, but it could be abdominal pain. It could be vomiting. It can be diarrhea. It can be headache. It can be a rash. It can be fatigue. It can be a single inflamed lymph node on the neck. There are so many manifestations we see. Um, it could also be the appearance of the tonsils. If you see in the picture, um, they have the white pustular spots on the tonsils, um, which oftentimes if people see these, they automatically assume it's strep um, and treat it. However, I will tell you mono, our mononucleosis, which is not a bacteria, it is a virus, 
looks very similar as far as those white pustular lesions. So um, just because they're the white pustular lesions does not make it strep, um, but strep can cause those. Um, there's often a certain odor to their breath, and you know it when you smell it, um, that that people that are have a strep infection will put off as well. Um, so this is one of those two things I mentioned we do give antibiotics for because it is a bacterial infection. So we give antibiotics for this. And it's important for you to know when are they no longer contagious. Um, so this goes with any infections. We talked about a little bit about this with conjunctivitis. Um, so for you to be considered no longer contagious, and this is with any infection, um, you have to be fever free for 24 hours, um, and that's without antipyretics. So usually that's where they want it less than 100.4, or and or you have to be on antibiotics for 24 hours. Um, so if you're talking about an infection where there was no fever to begin with, um, then 24 hours of antibiotics will suffice. Um, if they have a fever, then you need to wait for at least 24 hours until after that fever has dissipated to send them back to school, even if that means they've been on antibiotics for two or three days. Another good thing to teach parents is to change the toothbrush after 24 hours. Sometimes we don't think about that, um, but if you're still continuing to brush with the same infected toothbrush that you were before the antibiotics started, that can continue to transmit that infection over and over again and cause it to multiply. Typically, the treatment for strep infection is 10 days of amoxicillin. It's very important, and hopefully y'all remember this from farm. With any antibiotics, it's always important to make sure they take the full course of the antibiotics, not just until they're feeling better, because that's how we create those super infections. Um, what if they keep getting strep? Well, um, this can be a cause for them to get a tonsillectomy, um, which is where they will remove the tonsils. Um, the, the guidelines change. Um, typically, it is six strep infections in a calendar year is kind of the current guidelines, um, but it can also depend on the patient as well. So if they're getting more than six strep infections in a year, they'll start looking at needing to take those out. Um, so probably the more important thing for you to know, though, is how we care for these patients post-tonsillectomy. So one important thing you need to know about post-tonsillectomy is we never want to put anything in the mouth when they're in the hospital. So no tongue depressors. No, we're definitely not going to stick any gauze or, or um, cotton swabs or anything like, in that, like that in there because or suction tubing, um, the, the yonkers and things like that because you could hit those suture lines and cause bleeding. Um, another thing we want to make sure is we're monitoring for bleeding. So typically somebody who has had a throat surgery like that, the signs you'll see related to bleeding might be frequent swallowing um, and clearing their throat. Um, those may be a sign that they have internal bleeding and should be monitored for. Making sure they're doing the right diet, correct diet. So um, typically clears with no red dye is what's recommended. Cold clears um, to help soothe that throat and decrease the swelling. Um, the reason, and I know people have, take dairy all the time when they go home. Ice cream is what you think of as a post-tonsillectomy diet. Um, but when it comes to dairy, dairy coats the throat, um, which makes you want to clear your throat. And sometimes when they clear their throat, it causes causes um, a disruption in those sutures and can increase their bleeding risk. So really the best thing for the first couple days is just cold clears with no red because red can be hard to distinguish um, between bleeding and red dye. And of course, an, uh, um, encouraging rest um, and making sure they're staying well hydrated are those important key factors related to this. All right. So when most people think of croup syndromes, what they're referring to is laryngeotracheobronchitis. But really, croup disorders are characterized as epiglottitis, laryngeotracheobronchitis, and laryngitis. They all fall under croup disorders. Um, but when most people think of croup, they think of LTB or laryngeotracheobronchitis. This is often described as a barking cough or a seal-like cough. Um, if you are following along in the PowerPoint and you have the PowerPoint pulled up where it says laryngeotracheobronchitis, click on that and it will show you a video of what it sounds like and it'll show you some strider as well. <laughs> 
So what we worry about with croup, it's a viral illness, so not necessarily needs to be treated. But the reason this is a little bit different than the lower respiratory is um, the sounds it makes. So because it's upper respiratory, like you see in the top picture, that's where you get, you get more inspiratory symptoms and you get the barking cough as opposed to wheezing um, and a deeper cough. So this typically manifests um, within a couple days of exposure, um, last three or four days. Um, many children, um, it resolves without any kind of medication or intervention, um, but sometimes children will, their airway will narrow to the point they'll get what's called strider. It's a high pitched sound, almost like wheezing, except it's on inspiration. So when they breathe in, you hear, <gasps> Um, if you've ever heard somebody having an allergic reaction um, where they have airway closure, they can also have that symptom as well. Um, so these are definitely the children we would want to treat because um, that means their airway is not very open compared to where it should be. So the medication that we treat them with related to laryngeotracheobronchitis strider is called racemic epinephrine, spelled R-A-C-E-M-I-C epinephrine, E-P-I-N-E-P-H-R-I-N-E, -E -E, racemic epinephrine. So this works by opening up those airways. It's inhaled just like you do with albuterol, so it's given as a nebulizer treatment. But instead of working on the lower airways like albuterol does, this works on the upper airway. You can't use albuterol for this. Albuterol doesn't work in the right place. We will also often off often also give them systemic steroids as well, most commonly Decadron or Dexamethasone, um, which will help decrease that swelling over a period of time and really help it go away. The racemic epinephrine doesn't help it go away, the illness, it just opens up that airway. So you're treating the symptoms as far as that. <clears throat> As far as other treatment matter, measures, a humidifier works great. Um, it changes in temperature. So oftentimes patients with croup will tell parents to um, either take them in the bathroom and turn on the hot water as hot as you can and the steam, uh, help allow them to breathe in the steam. Or if it's winter time, take them outside and have them breathe in the cold air. That cold air helps decrease the swelling in the airway and actually works very, very well. Um, if they are um, hospitalized. We may um, have them in a mist tent, although you rarely, rarely see mist tents used anymore in the hospital setting um, because of the risk of infection associated with them. So in your book, there is tables that outline the difference in epiglottitis, laryngeotracheobronchitis, and laryngitis, which are all croup syndromes. Um, this one was laryngeotracheobronchitis. We're not really going to talk about laryngitis um, because it's not really significant. The biggest thing with laryngitis is losing your voice. But we are going to talk about the other croup disorder, which is epiglottitis. And fortunately, because of our use of vaccinations nowadays, specifically the HIV vaccine or the H flu vaccine, um, our rates of epiglottitis have extremely declined. Um, so it's very, very rare to see this nowadays, but it is important to recognize it because it's an emergency when it happens. Um, so if you look at that top picture, um, uh, uh, that's labeled A and B, A is a normal airway going through that epiglottis. B is that swollen airway in that white tube you see kind of coming down from the bottom. That's an endotracheal tube. So this patient's intubated um, to maintain that airway. But you see how much swelling um, and angry tissue there is around that area. So you can see why this is an emergency because those airways can completely swell shut. And that's what we worry about. Um, so typical symptoms of epiglottitis. You're going to see somebody who looks like the child sitting at the bottom. They tripod. They're sitting forward to open up their, their pulmonary space. They're often drooling because they can't swallow because of the swelling. And they don't have a cough because it's an upper airway. So the, where it's located, it does not make them cough. Instead, it's making them drool leaned forward. Um, oftentimes they have anxiety because they have air hunger. Um, so this is an emergency. Oftentimes they do have to get intubated um, because of this. But again, it's very rare to see this nowadays because of our, our HIV vaccine. Um, probably the biggest thing that's most important for you to know, um, especially with, as a nurse 
to recognize this is once it is recognized as epiglottitis, you do not want to stick anything in the mouth. This means you don't want to use a tongue depressor. You don't want to do a strep swab or a flu swab. Um, even though a, sw a flu swab goes in the nose, um, depending on how far you go, it goes down the, the post pharynx a little bit. Um, so you don't want to stick anything in there um, because if you hit that epiglottis, that irritation can cause it to completely close off and then you have lost your airway. Um, so you, you don't want to stick anything in the mouth in these children. It is viral. Um, so oftentimes if this happens, they may have to be intubated. They'll get systemic steroids, um, but there's no antibiotics because it is a viral illness. So when we're talking about infections of the lower airways, um, the three biggest ones are bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and then pneumonia. Um, the, the biggest difference in the three is location. So your bronchitis is in the bronchi, those bigger tubes coming down that go into your lobes. Um, the bronchiolitis, like respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, is the bronchioles, those smaller branches of the tree. And then pneumonia is located in your alveoli where fluid gets stuck in there and gets infected. Um, so the biggest difference is location. And again, that's why bronchiolitis like RSV is so significant in infants is because of those tiny airways um, becoming even more swollen that can greatly decrease um, their, their air exchange. So the biggest difference, again, between the three is location, which can make a difference in their, their symptoms as far as the sound of their cough, um, as well as as you get smaller into the airways, like for instance, bronchiolitis is more likely to produce wheezing than bronchitis, just because of the difference in that size of, size of airway. Pneumonia is more likely to cause oxygen desaturations because it's the alveoli where all of our gas is exchanged. Um, so some of those symptoms with it as well are just related to the type because of um, the location that it's in. So other symptoms that you see in general across our three, they may or may not have fever. Um, they often have cough, um, may or may not have wheezing, um, may or may not have congestion, especially in, in bronchitis and bronchiolitis. Oftentimes they start out or at least start as a dry cough um, and may progress to a junky cough over a couple days. Um, but typically cough is very common with all three of them. Um, so bronchitis and bronchiolitis are also viral typically in nature, so we don't give antibiotics for them. However, pneumonia, 100%, we always give antibiotics for it. And the reason is um, because pneumonia can progress so rapidly and cause problems with gas exchange more than bronchitis and bronchiolitis. And you can't typically tell from an x-ray whether it is a viral process or a bacterial process. They will go ahead and treat pneumonia with antibiotics. So your strep infection, I already mentioned, and your pneumonia, yes, antibiotics um, we give for those. Because, and another reason pneumonia can progress pretty rapidly, even if it starts out as a viral pneumonia, um, because of where it's located, it's in those alveolar sacs that makes it hard to get that out it's more likely to develop into a secondary bacterial infection. So they always treat those with antibiotics as well. So other measures we can use, so encouraging fluids. Fluids, as you know, are very important in respiratory infections, um, not only because we want their whole body to keep them hydrated, um, but when they get dehydrated, it thickens up those respiratory secretions, making it harder for them to get those out making it more likely that it's going to prolong the infection or maybe even worsening it using suctioning. Um, like I already mentioned before, suctioning with all those, um, preferably the least invasive suctioning you can. If there is, if you can use like a bulb syringe or that little mushroom tip, like I mentioned, and not actually have to do deep suctioning with a with a suction tube, um, that's better because it's less irritating to the, the inner passages of the nares giving oxygen if necessary. Typically oxygen use in, in pediatric patients is going to be 
on an as-needed basis. So just because they have pneumonia doesn't mean they'll be on oxygen. It'll be based on work of breathing as well as their oxygen saturation. So sometimes we will put patients, even if they're 100% oxygen saturations, we can still put them on oxygen just to um, aid their work of breathing. Because one reason that people often are scared of pediatric patients is their ability to to compensate. So pediatric patients are really good about maintaining that 100% oxygen saturation for a while. And they're breathing a little harder, they're a little more tachypnic, but their sats are 100, so we're good. And then all of a sudden they're not. Um, they can compensate for a whole lot longer than adults, but they crash a whole lot faster. Um, so we may give oxygen just for increased work of breathing, even if their sats are 100%. Because if they're working harder, it means there's the potential that they're only going to compensate but for so long, and then it's going to start to decrease, and we worry about that. So one, you may or may not have seen that unfortunately we're seeing a rise in with people not getting vaccines as much as they used to is called pertussis or whooping cough. We get that with the DTaP vaccine or the Tdap vaccine for older children um, caused by the Bordetella bacteria. So this one is bacterial. Um, so this is a third one that we give antibiotics for. Um, this was pretty close to eradicated, um, not er completely, but pretty close in the United States. Um, and now it's making quite a rise. Um, this is why all pregnant women are recommended to get a Tdap vaccine while they're pregnant so that they can have some of that passive immunity to that infant um, to help protect them before they get that first Tdap vaccine at about two months of age. Um, so pertussis or whooping cough um, typically takes a couple weeks before it really gets that distinctive whoop at the end of the cough. If, you, if you're following along with the PowerPoint that's associated with this, if you click on that pertussis that's in light blue, you'll hear what it sounds like. And it has this distinctive whoop at the end of the cough that gives it its name. Typically, children who have this, it takes a couple weeks before they develop that distinctive type of cough. Um, it's, it looks more like typical cold symptoms in the beginning. Um, so unless you're actually looking for that, if they don't have that distinctive cough, it may be easy to spread it around unless you're looking for that, uh, that specific symptom. So being aware of that. Um, so this cough um, is concerning because it can cause some pretty significant respiratory distress. If you watch the video, you click on the pertussis, you'll see she's having a very difficult time catching her breath as she's coughing. Um, it can cause periods of apnea, um, maybe hospitalization, maybe not, um, but it takes weeks to recover, um, and that's what makes it so significant and can cause some pretty significant respiratory distress. So, um, especially in your younger infants, um, it can be significant enough to, to cause hospitalization. So um, we're not seeing it that much anymore, um, but still be wary on the lookout, especially in your unvaccinated population is more likely where you're going to see it. And we also recommend to anybody that is going to be around an infant to get a Tdap vaccine as well. So dad, grandparents, siblings, anybody that would be around that child on a regular basis should get a whooping cough vaccine as well, because for that first couple of months before they get that first dose, they are highly susceptible to it, even with passive immunity from mom. All right, so those were our infectious diseases. Let's talk about our non-infectious respiratory diseases. Um, probably the biggest one that most people know of is asthma. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways, um, typically when patients have exacerbations, they have swelling of the airway and they also have increased mucus production. So the two symptoms compiled together create this impaired airway functioning, um, causing wheezing and difficulty breathing, cough um, that needs treatment um, right then. Even patients, when they're not having an exacerbation, if they have asthma, they have a certain degree of narrowed airways all the time. <laughs> 
So there's various different categories of it. It talks about in your book the categories. I don't want you to memorize the type type of categories, but basically the difference is there are some patients who are just on intermittent meds. Like for instance, if they have exercise induced asthma, they may need to take use their um, albuterol inhaler before they exercise. Um, all the way up to people who are on preventative medications like Palmacort, for instance, and take daily medications as a preventative but also need that albuterol inhaler on top of it. Um, so that's the biggest difference in the categories, just the level of severity and the amount of, of treatment that's regularly needed versus is it just PRN. So oftentimes asthma has an allergy component. Um, we call it in pediatrics the asthma, allergy, eczema, triad. Um, those three things um, oftentimes go together because they're all related to a, an overreaction of the body um, in response to stimuli. Um, and that stimuli is going to depend on the patient. Every patient is different. Um, some people have exercise-induced asthma. Some people have environmental allergy-induced asthma. Some people have tobacco-induced asthma. Some people have even food-related asthma symptoms. Um, sometimes it can be a food allergy that will trigger asthma symptoms. So it depends on the patient what triggers their asthma exacerbations, but it is important for those patients to know what their triggers are um, so they can identify them and hopefully avoid them. Um, so manifestations is typically, again, um, your, your increased work of breathing, cough, um, wheezing potentially, or maybe even no wheezing, even more concerning in a patient who is working really hard to breathe then wheezing is no wheezing because that can, especially if you give them albuterol and then wheezing appears, that means their airway was so narrow to begin with, um, it really wasn't letting them through. So once you gave the albuterol, it opened enough to finally make that whistling noise. Um, typically, asthma is not diagnosed before the age of three or really shouldn't be diagnosed before the age of three because under the age of three, their airways are so narrow. Um, if they are just a child that gets sick a lot and overreacts to illnesses, um, then it can be where they kind of grow out of it. Um, so if you diagnose them at two, and then at three, they start to get better, well, they've already been labeled with that asthma diagnosis. And this is important because once you have asthma, asthma doesn't go away. Um, people often say you grow out of asthma, which is untrue. Um, oftentimes, people's symptoms improve over time as their airways get larger or as circumstances may change. Maybe if they take allergy medications or allergy shots, um, situations can change as they get bigger um, that they may not have acute symptoms, um, but the asthma is always there. It's embedded in their genetics. Um, I'll give you an example. I have asthma and I stopped having symptoms around 15, 15 years old and was fine. And then all of a sudden when I was pregnant with my second child, I started having exacerbations from those hormonal influences associated with it. Um, so it can always come back at any time. And sometimes you'll see where adults who have a dissipation of symptoms and then they come back are actually worse than they were as a child. I'm um, just related to the way their body is responding to it. So how do we take care of patients with asthma? So the biggest thing for asthma is medication management. Um, there is really only two medications we give um, for your um, for your rescue medications as far as inhaled. Albuterol is the one most people think of. Um, your other one is ipratropium. Um, I P R A T R. I hold on. I P R A T R O P I U M. <laughs> ipratropium um, bromide. And this um, oftentimes you'll you'll have where hypotropium and albuterol are combined together, and you'll hear it called a duoneb. Um, the, both medications are bronchodilators. Um, the difference with hypotropium over albuterol um, that gives it a little extra edge is it also has an anticholinergic effect, so it helps 
um, dry up some of those secretions. So especially when in an asthma exacerbation, you want not just the, the bronchodilator, but you also want that um, drying effect of the secretion. So they work together very, very well. Um, most medications that are asthma medications or COPD medications are long-term medications. They're not going to work when you're having an exacerbation. So things like Palmacort, for instance, if you take it when you're having an exacerbation, it's not going to do anything at that moment. They have to be taken on a regular basis every day to build up in the system. Um, the only kind of steroids we use for um, acute exacerbations is systemic steroids like prednisolone or um, solumedrol, methylprednisolone, and those will um, work more acutely. Um, but your inhaled steroids that only work on the lungs, those are for long-term management. Um, and there are several different types. I recommend you get to know your categories, your leukotrienes, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and these help either prevent exacerbations or decrease severity of exacerbations. Or like in cases of albuterol and ipotropium, they help to, um, to decrease the effects while you're having an exacerbation. So one thing that's also important, especially in pediatrics, but I think really all patients should use this, even adults, is called a spacer. Um, so the spacer is what you see at the bottom right-hand corner, and the inhaler um, pushes into the spacer. So if you've ever had to use an albuterol inhaler or helped a patient use it, you got to take this deep, sharp breath in as you inhale that medication. And oftentimes what this does is it causes a cough response when you're taking a sharp breath in when you're already having increased work of breathing. So all that medication just comes right back out. Um, many studies have shown um, with the use of albuterol inhale or any inhaler really on its own that you're only getting about 20 to 25 percent of that medication even when used as recommended um so this spacer greatly increases and increases that medication um, that gets to the patient to almost 100 percent um, so what they do instead of taking a deep sharp breath in, you squeeze the inhaler pump once, and then you take six regular breaths, a little bit deeper, but regular breaths. And this helps it get into the, the airways more readily. It, it, it disperses it more throughout the tissue um, than just going right down into the bronchi and kind of ending there uh, or getting coughed back out. Um, in some facilities, I know they were doing this at MCV at one point, and they were actually using this as an alternative to NEB treatments. So instead of doing a NEB treatment, especially on younger children that would fight it so much, um, they would do six puffs of the inhaler equivalent to one nap. So you do one puff and then have them take six breaths through the spacer. Um, so they get all the med and then do one puff. And it sounds like six times that would take forever, but it's so much quicker than a nebulizer. It might take you three minutes to do that. Um, and you can watch babies, even if it's a baby, you can do this on because you can watch when they're taking those breaths and count. Um, spacers, I believe, should, again, should be used on everybody, but especially in the pediatric population, this is the only way that inhalers, me, inhaled medication should be given is through a spacer device, um, else it, it's kind of pointless. You're losing a whole lot of that medication. So another respiratory disorder that I know you haven't talked about in med surge because this is viewed as a pediatric disorder is called cystic fibrosis. Most people have at least heard of cystic fibrosis but might not know what it is. So the reason cystic fibrosis is categorized as a respiratory illness is because that's what most patients actually die from, is a respiratory illness or respiratory failure. Um, however, cystic fibrosis is not just respiratory like most people think. It encompasses multiple areas of the body. Um, the, the basis of cystic fibrosis is a DNA malfigura malfiguration um, where, and there's like 1,500 genetic abnormalities that can cause cystic fibrosis. So that's why you see varying um, differences and severities in patients that have cystic fibrosis. It's not across the board the same. Um, but 
what happens is it's a disruption in those sodium channel pumps in their cells um, is the pathophysiological basis. But what you need to know as a nurse is because of those disruptions in those pumps, they get really thick, sticky, highly salt concentrated mucus. So the lungs is kind of obvious why this is a problem. If you got thick, sticky mucus in your lungs, you can't get it out and you get infections and you get um, impaired air, airways because they become blocked with the secretions. But there are multiple parts of the body affected by this. They often off, also have GI um, difficulties um, for a couple reasons. They are more prone to get an ileus because of those th that thick mucus in their GI tract. Um, they often also have problems with digestion of food, so they have to take pancreatic enzymes um, because the pancreatic duct um, gets blocked. So those, those pancreatic enzymes, they need to break down their food, can't get from the pancreas, um, to the, um, uh, from the, from the gallbladder, um, and the pancreas, um, both. You have problems with the gallbladder duct becoming blocked as well. So they have lots of problems with GI dysfunction. Oftentimes they may have problems with respir or respiratory, reproductive, um, especially in men. Um, and it's not that their testicles don't work properly. They're producing sperm. It's just that the vas deferens gets blocked with the mucus um, and they can't get the sperm to where it needs to be. You can get that with women too, where the fallopian tubes will get blocked. Um, and even though the ovaries are working to produce eggs, they're just not getting to where they need to be. So cystic fibrosis is more common than you realize, especially carriers. Um, it is predominantly seen in the Caucasian population, but is seen in all races. Um, in Caucasians, about 1 in 26 to 27 people are a carrier for it. Um, so that's why they often will do... Uh, it's a big part of the genetic component, the newborn screening, because it's a little more common than you realize. Um, so there's various classes it's divided in. Again, there's many different genetic abnormalities that can lead to it, um, but we won't go into that specific part. It's more just the general overall care. So how do we diagnose cystic fibrosis? So the newborn screening that we do, we've talked about newborn screenings with newborns. That is exactly what it says. It is a screening tool. You cannot diagnose anything from the newborn screening. All that does is tell you, we think we may have a problem. We need to look farther into it. So the newborn screening tool just tells you an alert to look into it. The actual diagnostic test for cystic fibrosis is called a sweat chloride test. And you see a picture of it on the bottom right hand of your screen. And it's exactly what it sounds like. You put a patch on their skin and then with has an electrode to it that gives them just a tiny shock, not enough they even they even feel it but enough that it makes them sweat and the pad that's attached absorbs that sweat and then they test it for the concentration of sodium and chloride um, if it's higher concentrations than would be seen in the typical population then that is how they diagnose cystic fibrosis because their secretions are much more concentrated in sodium um, because of those disruptions in the sodium um, potassium pumps than the average population so that is how they they diagnose it. So presentation can vary depending on severity. Um, we talked about in newborns how you want to make sure they have a, a stool or bowel movement within the first 24 hours, uh, 24 to 48 hours. This is one of those many things they're looking for as a potential cause. If they um, don't have a stool, they might have what's called a meconium ileus, which you see in the top middle. Um, this may be the very first sign that there is a problem because they're probably going to show up with this before that newborn screening comes back. Um, as they get older, you may see more respiratory symptoms. They can have clubbing, the bottom um, left hand picture, um, which is a chronic um, deprivation of oxygen. Um, if you, the, the way they used to diagnose decades ago before there was any testing is you would um, lick their skin 
and if it tasted salty. So if the parents like kiss the baby and say they taste salty, that can be a sign of it as well. Um, please don't go around licking babies um, because we have much better technology now that we don't have to do that. But that is one way that they would um, diagnose this decades ago. So there are lots of manifestations and presentations um, that are involved with this, and some of it is based on individual systems. So let's talk about the two big systems, our respiratory and our GI. Um, so respiratory, again, is what we usually think of when we think of cystic fibrosis because that's what most children die of, and that's what's most notable about their symptoms. So these children need chest physiotherapy multiple times a day um, and what chest physiotherapy is is it is where they will um, use either their hands um, or a vest device or something that looks like a rubber cup and they will use it to pat over the lung fields um, or the vest will kind of shake it and what it does is it breaks up those secretions from the wall because they are thick they're harder to to cough up they get stuck to the the walls of the lung fields um, making it hard to cough them up so this will help break them up so they can get them up more readily um, they often are on multiple inhaled meds um, their regimen is going to vary a little bit depending on the child they may start out with an albuterol um, an atrovent and then they may go to um, inhaled tobramycin afterwards um, they they muca mist is another one or um, you're in acetylcysteine which most people think of as your antidote for acetaminophen which it is when you give it as a as a um antidote for acetaminophen you give it iv when you're given it is a mucolytic meaning to break up mucus in the lungs it's called muca mist um, and you give it inhaled so there's different um, reasons we would give that medication. So typically the progression of illness in a patient with cystic fibrosis is their lungs are gonna progressively get worse. Um, most patients um, die within their 20s or 30s of cystic fibrosis. This is why this is considered a pediatric disorder. Um, even adults, once they become adult age are still followed by pediatricians and still followed by pediatric respiratory um, pulmonologists. And the reason for this, again, is because they don't typically live a full adult life. Um, we had patients, these were the few patients we had admitted on the pediatric floor, so it was kind of odd to have a 30-year-old when you're used to having babies. Um, but they, they get admitted to the peds floors and they're followed by pediatric specialists for the remainder of their life. Um, it's very common for these patients to need double lung transplants, usually in their, tw in their 30s, I mean, I'm sorry, 20s. But the problem with a double lung transplant is they are very costly. Um, the place we always sent our, our double lung transplants to um, from VCU was Duke. That was the closest place to us that would do them in pediatrics. And the patients usually had to raise about $50,000 on their own outside of what their insurance would pay just for them to even accept the patients because they would be in some place like a Ronald McDonald house for months afterwards um, just recovering and getting therapy. Um, and unfortunately, with double lung transplants are not permanent, um, you're not fixing the genetic disorder. You're getting new lungs that aren't fibrotic and scarred and full of mucus, um, which means you kind of get to start over, but you've still got the underlying disorder, so you're still going to continue to get that buildup of new secretions, and you're going to start getting some new scarring. Um, so typically, patients that have had a double lung transplant only live about five to ten more years. Um, so it does add some time on, but um, not as much as you would expect considering what they have to go through to get those. Um, so it does progress. Um, and there are patients that live into their 40s and 50s, but it, that's more uncommon um, that you see that. So the other um, body system that you see that's mainly affected is the GI tract. So again, because of those thick, sticky, sticky secretions, they can get um, bowel obstructions and ileus. Um, they often have problems with digestion and breaking down of food because of the blockage of that bile duct. Um, with the blockage of the pancreatic duct, they often have problems with the pancreatic enzymes as well. Um, 
So they have to take pancreatic enzymes orally forever. Um, every single time they eat, they have to take pancreatic enzymes. The amount that they take will vary. Um, for example, at VCU, we always had two separate orders. We had an order for a meal dose and we had an order for a snack dose. So depending on how much they were eating, depended on how much we were giving them. Um, they come in, in capsules, um, but the capsules can be open and they got the little beads inside. You don't want to chew or crush the beads because they are um, made so that they get through the stomach and doesn't get broken down and you want it actually in the, the small bowel. Um, when it starts working um, but the capsules themselves can be opened up for children that are too young to um, to take capsules you can open them up and sprinkle them on like applesauce or, or things like that just a small amount enough for them to be able to swallow that um, but you don't want to crush the little beads inside and they do have to take this with every meal because they do not release enough um, these patients are often very, very thin and underweight. Um, this, I've had patients who are not, um, and again, it depends on the severity, but many of these patients are severely thin and overweight. Um, probably one of the most severe ones I had in regard to this aspect, he, um, at the time when I worked there, VCU had uh, McDonald's, and he was on what's called the McDonald's diet. Many of our cystic fibrosis patients were where they had a doctor's order that instead of getting the food from the hospital um, that was supplied to the patients, they got passes to to be able to purchase food at the McDonald's downstairs. And, and we would take them down there and let them get their food. And um, they even with eating McDonald's two or three times a day, and this patient was had a gastric tube and was getting continuous G2 feeds overnight and was still very, very thin. Oftentimes these patients are on about a 5,000 a calorie a day diet um, and they still it's because they're not absorbing because even with them taking those exogenous pancreatic enzymes it's still not the same as pancreatic enzymes that you would absorb from your own production so often very thin often have issues with blockages in their intestines Another thing that you see higher in this population than you do in the general population is diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Because of that biliary, um, I mean, so, I'm sorry, that pancreatic duct involvement, um, the pancreas is having to work so hard um, to push things out um, and working basically against a wall that it starts to decline. So you often see patients in their teens and 20s um, developing type 2 diabetes as an effect of systemic fibrosis. Um, it's treated the same. We still often give them Lantus and, and regular insulin. Um, we don't treat it any differently, but it is that wearing out of the, of the, the pancreas that puts them at an increased risk of developing um, type 2 diabetes later on more than the higher popular or more than the general population so again management is chest physiotherapy if you want to see what chest pt or chest physiotherapy looks like click on where it says chest physiotherapy in the, your powerpoint that you're following along with um, and you will see what that process looks like it takes um, many of you if you saw it at cumberland hospital you would have seen them using the vest which the vest is okay it's not as great as manual like we'll see in the video. Um, when I was in the hospital, we were instructed we were only allowed to do manual because um, if they were being hospitalized and they needed that higher level of intensity. Um, manual chest PT typically takes about 45 minutes. Um, so if you watch the video, you'll see why um, our respiratory therapy students were the ones who typically did most of the chest PT. Um, we as techs would do it if... Um, if there was not a respiratory therapy student available. Um, but you saw they had some big arms. <laughs> and there's a reason if you watch the video, it's 45 minutes of pretty intense um, therapy because um, you want to make sure you get all sides and all lung fields. Um, and it really helps them cough those secretions up. It can literally mean the difference in life or death when you do chest physiotherapy adequately or inadequately when you're talking over a period of time.
And again, in addition to chest PT, they often take several medications. Um, almost always they're going to take a bronchodilator before that chest PT to help open those airways so they can get more secretions up. They may take an inhaled antibiotic afterwards. Um, they may take an acetylcysteine again, which is your mucamus. Dornase is another common one. Um, so all those things that they'll take um, just for respiratory. And this is three to four times a day usually. Um, so this isn't like a one-time 45-minute therapy and they're done. This is three to four times a day. So it's a huge chunk of their life that is devoted just to keeping them from, from dying. Um, and then with GI, the biggest thing is those exogenous pancreatic enzyme capsules. Again, they can take the capsules whole or they can open them up and sprinkle the little beads onto something. Um, they need a high protein, high calorie, high fluid, high salt diet. Again, high protein, high calorie, high fluid, high sodium. And the reason for this, the protein and calorie is to give them um, the, the nutrition they need to build muscle and to um, regulate their body functions and things like that. The high um, fluid is because everything with the, with the way those sodium channel pumps work, um, it, it makes everything super sticky and thick. Um, so the more hydrated they are, the more you can potentially thin out those secretions. And the high sodium is because they're losing a lot of sodium through sweat and body secretions, again, because of that disruption in that sodium channel pump. So high protein, high calorie, high sodium, high fluid diet. So last thing we'll talk about is SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. We talked about this a little bit um, with newborns, um, so we're not going to harp on it too much. The biggest way to reduce the risk of sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS is back to sleep. Um, that's the big slogan we have nowadays and has greatly reduced the, the cases of SIDS. Um, Typically, um, SIDS most commonly occurs in infants under the age of six months. Um, but they will classify those undetermined deaths up to a year um, as being SIDS. Um, so the reason at six months their risk greatly decreases is because of their ability to turn back and forth. So once they are able to turn their head more readily or flip themselves from, from front to back and back to front, um, that they have more ability to move and not suffocate although they do still have a rest. So back to sleep. So they can either sleep on their back or even on their side as long as there is a way to um, stabilize them so don't flip over onto their bellies. Um, other things that have been shown not as definitive in decreasing risk but are things that are recommended. Um, one that is definitive is not putting anything extra in the bed other than baby and one sheet. So no blankets, no pillows, no stuffed animals, no blankets, um, nothing like that. Um, using pacifiers has been shown to, to help because it keeps the airway open. Having a fan blowing near them helps to circulate the air, again, keeping that airway open. Um, making sure they don't get overheated, getting overheated increases their risk, and that fan helps with that as well. Um, making teaching parents, if they smoke, um, they need to quit. Or a minimum, don't smoke around baby, of course. Um, but even the oftentimes parents who are smokers, especially with infants, think that as long as they don't smoke around baby, they're okay, but the residue left on their clothing and hair, that alone can increase risk as well. So encouraging parents to quit smoking if that's um, a factor. Um, so the biggest thing associated with sudden infant death syndrome is back to sleep, having them sleep on their back or even on their side if you can stabilize them on their side and not allow them to flip over. Once they are able to roll on their own, over onto their stomachs. Again, it's not as concerning. Um, so you want to, even when they're younger than that though, encouraging them to be on their bellies during the day when they're awake, something we call um, tummy time, which helps to promote neck muscle development. Um, so telling parents during the day when they're awake, yes, tummy time is great. Um, it helps to develop those neck muscles, but when they're sleeping, they should be on their back.